You're watching Current, where hope flows. Join us for great times of laughter and enlightenment as together we get to know our Lord more intimately as we tackle tough subjects all from a biblical perspective. You're watching Current, where hope flows. Hi everyone, I'm Barbara Beck and I'd like to welcome you to Current. The ladies and I have a very important and difficult subject that we're going to be talking about today. One which the church has often avoided, but one which we need to be talking about, and that's suicide. Unfortunately, suicide is rampant in our culture. 44,000 Americans die every year from suicide, and it's the third leading cause of death for 15 to 24-year-olds and the second leading cause of death for 24 to 35-year-olds. And here's a disturbing fact about suicide. For each person taking his or her life, at least six others, loved ones, friends, neighbors, co-workers are all affected. Some serious repercussions for so many. Well, what does the Bible teach about suicide, if anything? Is it forgivable? We're going to be talking about this today with the current ladies and get their insights and observations. Not an easy topic, but I'm glad our ladies are willing to discuss this together. Thank you so much, ladies, and welcome. Hi, Hi. Barbara. Hi. Glad to have everybody. We have a new beautiful face on the panel, <laughs> Rhonda Hunter. Thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thank you for asking me to be here on the panel today. As you know, I've not ever um, talked about this um, subject um, publicly. I've not ever shared my story publicly, um, but I'm hoping that in my sharing of my story and sharing some of the painful parts of my sh story, other people will be able to um, Absolutely. share their stories as well. Absolutely. And there may be some viewers out there today who are not familiar with your story. So I want you to tell a little bit of your story, but um, your husband, Isaac Hunter, fabulous preacher, yes. fabulous man of God, someone yes. that you love dearly, was a wonderful husband and father in so many ways. Yes. But he passed away, committed suicide how many years ago? Uh, I was in 2013, so almost five years ago. Almost five years yeah. ago. Yeah. So um, we're going to be talking about that a little bit on, on the panel. And, and, and I want you to be able to share what you want to share. I don't want you to share any details that you're not not comfortable sharing. But I know one of the things that, that I talked about in the opening was how many people the, uh, the collateral damage yes. that happens when somebody commits suicide, yes. right? Yes, absolutely. And um, and it's a subject that we do need to be talking about more. Um, in over half of the states in our country, um, we've seen a rise um, in the suicide rate by over 30 percent. Um, that's a huge number. Are we talking about pastors or just talking about people in general? Just people in general. Wow. Um, but it's happening with pastors too, which is, is super disturbing. It is, yes. Um, I know of five um, senior mm. pastor's wives who I'm friends with. Um, we text every Sunday um, because Sunday is, of course, obviously would be the hardest um, day for us. Um, but we, um, yeah, have very similar stories. And yeah. so I think it's helpful to... Um, talk about what were some of the common things and some of the common threads that we um, have shared mm -hmm. in our stories um, that, um, you know, maybe if we um, speak about them, yeah. other people then yeah. will... Um, well, we yeah, have two see. other pastor's wives on the panel, Deborah Jackson, Marvin Jackson's beautiful wife from River of Life Christian Center and Gabriel Salguero's beautiful wife, Jeanette, uh, from Calvario City Church. But as pastor's wives, that's amazing to me, three pastor's wives yes. here on the panel. Yes. Do you ever worry about your husbands and all the pressure that they have to be perfect, right? Don't you have to right. be perfect as a, as a pastor? Yeah, I call it the fishbowl syndrome. Yes. <laughs> Just yes. living in a bowl and everyone sees what you do, what you don't do. Right. But um, yes, I do worry about Gabriel. Mm -hmm. um, he is an amazing man. Most of you know who he, he is. He is amazing. Um, my I little boy, worry. I call him. Yes, right? yes. yes. <laughs> he considers you a mom. Yeah, I consider him like a son. And I pray for my husband significantly, yeah. significantly. I pray for my family significantly. Um, one thing that we do, and we're very open about it, and we tell the church, we have a therapist. We have a therapist. We call it our safe right. space. Yes. And because who else could you share with? Yeah, we can't, we can't share, share with members of the church. We can't, we can't share with our mm -hmm. colleagues. So who do we speak to? Right. So we have this amazing Good. man That's of God. His name is John. And we meet with him once by ourselves, once a month, and then together once mm. a month. That's wonderful. And it's our safe space yeah, where we right. can just detox because we have to hold not just our 
problems, but also problems yes. of parishioners. Yeah. Yeah. So it's our safe space, so I highly recommend yeah. that. And right. I love that your church has put that in place, like while right. everything is normal, while yes. things, you know, yes. while you're not in trouble, yes. while you're mm -hmm. not struggling in your marriage. Mm -hmm. um, because then there is that safe place to go yeah. with the information. You already have that accountability built up with that um, mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. That's rare. That's very yeah. rare. Do you all have anything with like that? My situation is that um, I'm the executive pastor at the church. So I'm the person that makes sure everything that he he paints the vision, yeah. and I'm the person that oversees it and makes sure things yeah. run the way. I think she wants a high five. <laughs> 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 yeah. Make sure that so I can take some of that off of his plate, but I cannot take the authority yes. of him being yes. the visionary. But so I pray for him a lot. Uh, I I am truly his biggest cheerleader. Mm. He's an awesome teacher, an amazing teacher. Mm. I mean, if you want to hear the word and hear the word being broken down the so you yeah. can hear it he and is. apply it. He's a good teacher. So I have to freeze him up for some things so that he can spend time hearing from the Lord so he can prepare when he's yeah. um, preaching and teaching. Yeah. But the other thing is we have, we have loving pastors. They're not in the city. Uh, our pastor is uh, Pastor John K. Jenkins, and he's in um, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And we talk to him. Good. We have yeah. a relationship that if we have any problems or any concerns, if I have any problems or concern mm -hmm. with him or with the church, I can go to him. So we can be open to them mm -hmm. and, and be um, just transparent. Yes. Mm -hmm. And see, yes. that's what we need. Because right. people are looking at and think, they think that we're perfect. Hmm. We're not perfect. We not tell people all the time, we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we, we don't want to believe that. You know, <laughs> really. I know, I know that it's yes. true, but you don't. You want you to don't. believe that, that Rhonda's family is perfect right. and your family and Leanne right. and Mo and that, that all of us have the, that we look on the inside yes. like we look on the outside. And it's just, it's a, it's a myth. And everybody know? needs somebody. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they can just be transparent to. Yeah. I'm not feeling this today. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And be real. Mm -hmm. and, but I do think people in ministry as well, they have a huge target on yes. their backs. And, but you guys are aware that you have a huge target right. on your back, right? Yes. We were aware as well. And I think that um, the shocking part to me was how quickly and how fast um, Satan got a foothold. But you sought help too. You saw the red flags and you sought help from the church. I know one of your messages that you want to convey because we talked ahead of time is to really help the church, equip the church to come alongside pastor's wives or husbands, whatever the case may be, and, and help and believe them. You weren't really, were you not, were you sort of discredited or not believed? Um, I think our church did as best as they could have possibly okay. done. I mean, they were blindsided as much as I was. I knew that, you know, there was stuff going on in our home. I, um, I knew that there were addiction issues. I was fearful that there could be some infidelity. Um, but I didn't know the magnitude of it, and yeah. I didn't know that he wasn't going to be able to um, kind of get a handle on it and mm -hmm. turn that ship around. Um, so uh, to say that the church knew what was going on, I don't know that that was, is fair to say. I don't know that I ever went to them um, ahead of time and said, hey, we have a problem here. Okay. And I didn't because so many other people pastor's wives who are in my position, mm -hmm. you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you, can't, yeah. you can't do that without your um, husband losing his job. So um, yeah, there were um, family members who knew what was going on in our home. Um, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. But so what can be done? What could we do? You know, there are people out there listening today. Everybody knows somebody, mm -hmm. right, right, who mm -hmm. has been affected by suicide. So what can we do as the average Christian, a Christ follower, to come alongside people that are in danger or that are vulnerable or, you know, well, what's our job? You know, what can we do? We have to destigmatize mm. this conversation. And Barbara, I, I thank mm -hmm. you for bringing this to the forefront. And Rhonda, Thank mm -hmm. you for your yes. courage. We have to talk about this. As I grew up, medication for mental health conditions was a no-no mm -hmm. in our churches. I mean, we may have experienced mm -hmm. that, oh, God will heal you, God mm -hmm. will heal you. Right. Well, you, if you have diabetes, then what do you do? You take insulin. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a mental health condition, it's okay to take medication mm -hmm. for it. Um, before I became a pastor, I worked in the business industry and in benefits. And I worked with two major insurance companies across the nation where we did a study on uh, clergy. 
Mm -hmm. And we have a white paper, it came out about maybe eight years ago, but it's, st um, it's still relevant today, a white paper that indicated the clergy profession is the sickest profession. Mm -hmm. Above doctors, above lawyers, and when, when I mean the sickest profession, high cholesterol, mm -hmm. yeah. mental health yeah. condition, diabetes. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Why is that? The question mm -hmm. is why is it? And, what is the church? What are the parishioners? What are other colleagues, clergy colleagues, doing yeah. about this? Right, so. very little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was an um, active nurse, I worked at the last job I had was I was over a mental health mm -hmm. um, clinic, inpatient, outpatient. The thing about depression, it is it progresses. You don't wake up one day and you want to commit suicide. You get the something bothers you. You don't. You feel a lack of not being able to um, provide, or you're not doing what you think you should be doing. Something happens. Something yeah. triggers that, and it, it progresses to that level. But the thing about it is, as um, people of God, as pastors and pastors' wives, when we see that that change, because it's subtle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and see that's how the devil moves. Mm -hmm. He's subtle. Mm -hmm. He'll whisper things into your ears. Yes that you're not gonna make it, you're not, you're not good enough, you're not, you know, you're just not doing what you're supposed to do, something, whatever it is that's gonna make you look inward and not look outward to God mm -hmm. for your help and for your source. So sometimes you have to look at that subtleness that's happening in that person's life. And with us being pastors, we have to make sure that we are whole because it's hard to keep pouring out and pouring out. Mm -hmm. You've got to have at least one or two people in your life that they can jack you up mm -hmm. and say, look, mm -hmm. that's not right. You're not yes. doing this. You're not doing yes. that right. But let me help you get up. Let me help you put you back on the right yes. path, just between us. Yes. Let me help you. And a lot of times, we don't want people to know that we're hurting, we're broken, that we need help. Right. But we're going, to have to, we're going to have to do this because it's hard to keep pouring out. Mm -hmm. Because once you pour out, you, after a while, you're empty. And when you have those few people, those right. um, you know, two or three people who you can be completely authentic mm -hmm. with, they're able to pick up on yes, some of are. those yes. um, things that are changing in mm -hmm. your personality or changing uh, or, or that the spouse is right. saying. I never did go forward to our church and say, mm -hmm. you know, um, this is what's going on in our home. I, part of it was because I was so confused. Sure. Um, but I did say something's off, something's very wrong. Okay. Um, and, and things okay. like that. I don't expect them to know, but now I'm hoping that other churches will be able to um, pick up on those things and know. Well, that's um, why it's so important for you to be talking yes. and right. using your voice. You have a powerful voice, Rhonda, because you've been there, you've done that, and, and you and the other ladies, too, that you're friends with. That yeah. We need to be talking about these yes. things. Nobody yeah. wants to, yes. but we have to be talking about these things. Right. I think, Barbara, it's, you know, this is... This is just pastors we're talking about right now, but suicide right. in general, right. yeah. I mean, is yes. something that has to be talked about. You know, last year, it's heartbreaking. My son goes to middle school, and a little girl took her life in the middle mm. school. And, you know, and, and I oh. thought, I, I got in prayer immediately. When we heard that happen that day, and then he would be coming home, I thought, we got to talk about this at dinner. Yeah. We have to talk about this. We have to talk about it. We have to talk about it. You can't, it cannot be something that you just go, oh gosh, this gives me anxiety, I just pray it's never my kids, I just pray, you know, and you can't do that. You have to open up your, open up your mouth and talk. And, and you know, that's when the devil loses his power, uh -huh. when we can speak it. Because, yes. you know, I remember exactly. sitting at the table and saying to him, saying, honey, that devil whispered in her ear and, and he's whispering in all of your ears. Mm -hmm. And you need to know that. And you're going to hear that. You're going to hear. And, you know, and I just said, you just have to be prepared because he's going to try with you. He tries with everyone. That's his goal to steal God's beautiful plan for your life. Mm -hmm. And you have to recognize and we have to teach our kids at such a young age that, that that voice you hear, you need to tell him to leave in Jesus' name, right. that he has no authority with you. And it's such a, you know, important thing that we are talking to our youth, talking to them about this because, you know, I mean, I was a teenager. I remember being, I remember the enemy wanting to take me out. I remember that. And I, re, you know, and he's, 
You know, he know. I, I sometimes wonder, I think, how much does Satan know about what the God's plans are for your life? Because mm. they say mm. he has a bigger target on people that are going to be in ministry and do mm. that sort of thing. Mm. And you just kind of think. And so I always say, God's got such a beautiful plan for your life, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You, you want to get to that future, you've got to learn how to shut that enemy's mo shut his mouth yeah. in Jesus' yeah. name. It's in the Jesus name of Jesus. Name. That's right. Yes. That's right. That's right. Rhonda, having been there personally and experienced it firsthand, you know how important it is after the fact to have friends like Leanne mm -hmm. who come along beside you and to help you. Um, what did you glean from it and how did you minister to Leanne? How did you minister to Rhonda? <laughs> you know, I think... Um, I can probably answer that better. Yeah, than probably, because I was so <laughs> sad in, um, myself. I, mean, I, think, I still don't think my husband's gotten over it. Yeah. Vince was in a Bible study with um, Isaac, and um, I just remember thinking we just have to be present for her, yeah. you know, just because a lot of times words, there's no words that are they're even applicable except yeah. to just be there, you know. Well, and be there, they, oh, yeah, they Christmas. were. Yeah. Christmas. <laughs> so what can people do? What, what can, even five years down the road, Rhonda, what do people do for, for someone in my position? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I will say that what helps at the very beginning is just financial security, right? Mm -hmm. You lose not only your husband, the father of your children, but you lose your job, oh, <laughs> you yes. know, all at yeah. the same time. And, um, and, and Leanne was really instrumental um, in our church to um, come alongside um, me and our board and, and try and figure out what would help Rhonda and the kids financially. Right. Um, that's that's that the biggest huge. piece at the beginning, yeah. for sure. Um, but gosh, five years out, it's just um, understanding that, um, you know, it's hard grief work. Suicide is a hard um, thing to work through. Um, it's kind of twofold. You're grieving the person that you lost, mm -hmm. um, but you're also um, grieving the way in which they died. Um, and so um, understanding that there's not a timetable for that and there's not um, a playbook for, for that. Right. Um, everybody right. grieves in different um, ways, but remembering those um, special dates is um, always a helpful one. Yeah. And even people talking about him, like he was the great man that he was, right? Does that Yeah, count? I do believe that. I mean, I, I realize he made very wrong choices. Um, and I have to make sure I say that out loud because right. I can have a tendency to forget that those wrong choices really did hurt my kids. Mm. Right. Um, and right. so that's hurtful for them if I don't acknowledge that. Yes. Um, but he was a good man and he yeah. was a gifted. He was so gifted, oh, so gifted. Um, such a gifted yeah. communicator and so gifted by God in the way that he understood scripture and, um, and mm -hmm. taught me more about Jesus than, you know, I'd ever known. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's a big loss. Scripture to close us out here, Leanne. Yeah. Psalms 34, 17 just says, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, Rhonda Hunter, I cannot thank you enough for having the courage to come on and to give us a glimpse into your life so that we can better understand how to live victoriously in spite of all of the horrible things that are out there and to how to come alongside you and your children and, and, and viewers. I, I just hope and pray that this segment today has been one which gives you a little insight into, into suicide and how horrific it is and yet what a great plan God has for each one of our lives if we will just go to God's Word and continue to study and to learn and to lean on Him all things are possible. We want you to seek help if you need to seek help. We want you to talk to somebody. We want you to have a support system. We want you to, to talk at the dinner table about suicide with your families. Um, we've got more coming up. We'll be right back. Watch Current every day where hope flows. Moments with Mo. Every second our heart is beating and our blood is pumping and our body's working is a gift. It's a gift from God. In John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus said, I came so that you may have life and have it in abundance until it overflows. But right before that, he says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus warns us in his word that the devil is very real. He's very calculated and his agenda is destruction. 
Make no mistake about it, my friend. The devil is our enemy and he wants nothing less than to steal the perfect life from you that Jesus died for you to have. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Friends, recognize that the devil is real. He's a thief, he's a liar, he's the father of lies, and he will lie to you. In order to protect ourselves from his schemes, we must know how to decipher his lies. We do this by knowing the truth. The truth of God's word helps us to recognize the lies of the devil. Lies like, this world would be better off if you weren't here. Or lies like, just take your life. All this will be over and you won't have any worries anymore. Or lies like, your family deserves better, just end it now. My friends, I know he whispers these things to you. He whispers them to everyone. The devil is not smart. He's not creative. He's just roaming around, roaring like a lion, looking for someone who's feeling weak enough that they'll believe his lies so he can pounce. Here's the good news. We aren't ignorant of his schemes. We know how he works. When we know the word, we can recognize when we're hearing lies and we can rebuke him in the name of Jesus and he has to flee. We can speak the word out loud at the enemy and he'll leave with his ugly tail between his legs. The truth is, Satan has no defense against the name of Jesus and the word of God. Listen, friend, this is crucial. If you're hearing any of these lies, rebuke them immediately in the name of Jesus. Give that enemy no chance to speak. He has no authority over you. Then find a trusted friend to speak with, a counselor or a pastor. Let them know how you've been feeling so they can pray with you and encourage you in truth and some steps towards healing. Your life is precious. God has a plan and a purpose for you and it's life, it's life in abundance. We will have dry seasons. We'll have seasons of joy and seasons of pain, but make no mistake about it. Though sorrow may last for a night, joy comes in the morning. If you're still breathing, God has things for you to do. Your life has value and purpose. Every life does. From the tiniest of baby in a mother's womb to the hundred year old in a nursing home, you are God's child and you have purpose. Dear sister, dear brother, you're loved. You're loved by a God who would lay down his life for you. Our God is enamored with you. Never doubt that you are loved and your life is precious. For more on renewing your mind in the Word of God, visit us at Unforsaken Women or check out our website, unforsakenwomen.com. Hi, I'm Johnny Erickson Tata. Let me ask you, which pain do you think is worse, emotional pain or physical? Well, like you, I have faced both. I deal daily with chronic pain, and for the most part, I am able to distract myself and push it into the background with, with things to do. But I cannot push emotional pain into the background, and that's why I'm convinced it is harder to deal with. You cannot sweep feelings of mental anguish or heartache aside. Pain like that creates an emptiness that refuses to be crowded out of your thoughts. But I think God permits this inner anguish because it forces us to come to Him out of that, that desperate, urgent need, oh Jesus, I can't do this, because His Spirit lives inside your heart 
the Lord is never closer than when your heart is aching. It's why the Bible says that we can praise the God and Father of all compassion. He is that close. Jesus is your prescription for pain. Little wonder then that the Bible calls him the healer of broken hearts. That's good to remember when the pain isn't in your hip or your head, but in your heart. I pray that you got some hope and encouragement out of our program today. Suicide is a difficult subject to discuss, but one which we, as the body of Christ, need to be talking about. The Bible teaches that the thief, that's Satan, he comes only to steal and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and to have it to the full. That's what Jesus wants for us, a full, abundant life. Well, as you probably know, many families have been tragically affected by suicide and have unspeakable hurt in their lives. I remember when I was teaching school many years ago, I had a precious little student who lost his dad to suicide. I couldn't imagine the pain that he must have been experiencing. Rejection, betrayal, maybe abandonment. Did my little student wonder, was I not good enough for dad? Did he not love me, my mom and my siblings? Well, my heart went out to that family. And since then, I've known several other situations where someone has been desperate enough to want to end this difficult life. I can't judge, I can't really even empathize because I've personally never been there. But this I do know, we cannot fully understand the depth of pain and desperation that would lead someone to make that choice. We can't say, oh, that person was such a coward or he or she didn't love the family enough. No, all we can do is pray for those left behind and try to keep from being angry at that person. I pray that if you're one who's been affected by a loved one's suicide, you'll simply choose to forgive. We can't try to understand, we can't and mustn't judge, but we can love and forgive. That's all, love and forgive. And that, dear friends, is our note of hope for today. Thanks so much for joining us, and God bless you. You just watched Current, a Good Life 45 original production. That makes you part of our hope team here on Good Life 45, where hope happens.